Today we're going to talk about some things to keep an eye on while your wines are bulk aging. As we enter into the summer months and you're really enjoying the outdoors, it's kind of easy to forget about all the wines that you might have in your basement and kind of neglect them enough that something could easily start to veer off course. So this video is kind of to remind you to go down and check on them and also kind of let, let you know some of the things that I like to keep an eye on. So there's going to first be some preventative stuff that we're going to do because ideally you just don't want to have any problems with that wine. So a little bit of prevention goes a really, really long ways with wine. So the first thing I'm always going to do, especially in the summer when you're out having a good time, is just come down every once in a while and check your airlocks. Just make sure that they're all still full enough that um, you're getting that protection from oxidation. I really like these double bubble style airlocks because you can actually see if, the, if it's sealed because it's kind of pushing that bubble to the side. I also like to fill them with something a little bit more microbially stable than water. So I'll usually put some sort of vodka in there. Sometimes I'll put a little bit of star sand or something to give it a little bit of acid. And that generally works very well. The double bubble style also, it's just a little bit less likely to evaporate because it's got a really small surface area. And on some of these, you'll see I've actually put a little marble on the top to keep the fruit flies out and also to um, kind of keep that you know liquid in there from oxidizing. You can use a solid bung. I, I don't like to do that because my fear is always that I'm gonna you know be upstairs and not come down here for one or two weeks and have found out that one of those bungs flew off during the natural expansion and contraction of that wine. And if that were to happen, without a doubt, your wine is going to be oxidized badly. So a little safer to use an airlock. And that brings me to my second point. As long as you keep that wine topped up, there's very little risk of oxidation with an airlock like this. So come down to your basement or wherever you store your wines. And just at the point of bulk aging, once you're kind of done with active fermentation, you really, really want to make sure that those wines are topped up all the way to the neck like this if you're using a carboy. Or if you're using a barrel, you also want to make sure that it's topped up because those are going to continually sort of lose a little bit of wine to evaporation. So some people will top those up once a month, once every two months. Some people claim that it's better not to top up a barrel because it'll create a small vacuum inside, but I don't know. I think it's better to top up because every time you top up to, you can always get a check on those sulfites and things just to make sure that that, that, that wine doesn't kind of drift off and into a bad land of oxidation. Another sort of preventative thing that you're going to want to do is, you know, every time I sort of check on the wine, take a little sample, take a little taste, I'll always do a pH measurement. Just make sure that the pH hasn't drifted too much on you, and it really shouldn't. It generally is very stable. But if you had a wine that was, you know, 3.7 already kind of on the edge, and it drifted its way up to 3.75 or 3.8, it's one of those wines you're going to want to really, really keep an eye on because it could really easily oxidize at a pH up near the high three sevens. So you can do a couple things about that. Normally you want to make acid adjustments really early in the process so all those acids can integrate, but it's okay to make a small subtle adjustment. Occasionally I'll make a really slight adjustment during the aging period if something is drifting up or it might be a good time to think about some blends. If you've got a wine that's pH 3.5 and you've got another wine that's pH 3.78, you could have a, a wine that's right in the sweet spot of, you know, mid 3.6s or 3.6, and both of those wines would probably benefit from that. Aside from any of the preventative stuff you're going to do, 
you do want to watch out for anything that you know has gone wrong because the earlier you can catch it the better so some obvious signs of oxidation are going to be browning if you see browning you're you're probably pretty oxidized you can sometimes try to bring that wine back with something that has a little bit of reducing potential like sulfur dioxide or sulfites the other things you're going to want to sort of watch for that you're going to see right off the bat are something like a um, like a floor yeast f-l-o-r that's the yeast that gives sherry its kind of um, distinct smell and it's not unusual for that kind of wine to get in a or that kind of yeast to get in a wine that has become completely unprotected from or un you know sulfite if all the sulfites have sort of oxidized their way out then you start to enter some of these bad yeasts that will kind of feed on alcohol and things and create these really sort of unwanted smells in what you might consider otherwise to be a, f a fresh wine. You're going to want to every once in a while, um, I'm not saying you want to open these all the time, you're going to open these wines maybe every two to three months to check on them and just kind of do a full-blown sensory evaluation. So you're going to learn a lot from the smell of that wine. You can smell most forms of oxidation so if you smell acetic acid or vinegar if you smell um, acetaldehyde which is that kind of nutty smell that you get in a sherry or even a port wine um, and if you smell um, ethyl acetate which is kind of smells like nail polish remover or um, acetone those are kind of three forms of oxidation that all sort of originate from acetobacter which is a bacteria that if the wine is not properly sulfited and it gets just a little bit of air exposure it'll just start to kind of feed on that ethanol and turn it into some kind of bad stuff so you see that stuff you're gonna want to make, I mean you, you certainly probably have almost no sulfite if you see that you could find that the root cause could be an airlock that has dried up. Um, maybe you had your wine and you left a lot of head space. That's another common root cause for, you know, oxidizing out all the SO2 and leaving enough oxygen for some of those bad bacteria. Again, there, there's not a lot you can do to prevent it, but if you catch it early enough, you can stop it in its tracks by properly sulfiting it. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail into how much. If you swing by my website, smartwinemaking.com, I've got a post in huge detail about how to properly sulfite. And you might want to check that out if you have not. And like I said, the SO2 can sometimes kind of bring that wine back a little bit if it's just starting to oxidize. So if you're just getting a little bit of that nutty acetaldehyde, um, you can sort of bind that up with sulfur dioxide sometimes. So it's something you can try. And the other thing you can sometimes do, and I, you really want to be very careful if you do this, is you can sometimes blend out a tiny, tiny bit of oxidation with a wine that is completely good and unflawed. The thing you just want to be very careful about if you do that is that you don't make too bad wines. So sometimes a wine just has to go down the drain and there's nothing you can do or if you had a license to distill you could probably make some brandy or something out of it now aside from things that can go sort of wrong other things i'm kind of trying to do during this bulk aging period is dial in the oak so rather than add the oak all at once i'll just add a little bit at a time until that oak kind of gets to the level that I want it and it's hard to really know how much oak you need until that wine sort of starts to mature into what it's going to be so I'll usually start with some of the harsher oaks like the lighter toasts um, like a medium toast sometimes I can get a light toast 
And then as I kind of go further along, I'll sometimes step more into the medium or medium plus toasts, which are a little bit more smooth and can kind of help to round a wine out. And then the last thing that I like to do is, you see I've got all these wines here. Very few of these are just gonna go straight into the bottle without me at least trying some kind of blend. So, you know, maybe I'll blend 20% of a Merlot in with a Cabernet Sauvignon. There's a lot of wines that just make really great blending partners. So I like to kind of explore that if I'm opening a wine to test it. So kind of check on it and maybe just do some kind of like rogue blends where you've got a couple wine glasses and you just kind of see do these two wines, you know, make each other better or worse together. The ideal thing with blending is you really want to create that one plus one equals three situation where when you put those two wines together, the finished resulting wine is better than either of those one wines by themselves. Something that's kind of happening when you're going through a warm summertime like this is you are kind of assuring that that wine is stable, heat stable. So we talk about cold stabilizing to make sure you don't end up with those tartrate crystals in the bottle. Well, it's sort of nice to let that wine warm up a little bit for just at least a brief period of time so that um, anything that was going to happen is going to happen in the carboy. So let's say that your malolactic fermentation had stalled out and you didn't know it. Oftentimes in the summertime, you might find that one of your carboys just throws a few more bubbles. And if it gets through a full summer cycle, most likely any of those kind of last minute fermentations that might have sort of stalled out or maybe, you know, a little bit of sugar went in because as you add oak, oak has a tiny, tiny bit of sugar. That kind of stuff can sort of ferment off and make it a little bit less likely that you would end up with a little bit of effervescence in the bottle. I hope that was pretty helpful for you. And if you have anything that I might have missed that you like to check on during the summer months, when you're out enjoying yourself but you don't want to forget about your wines, make sure to mention in the comments below. Thanks for watching.